I am really excited to introduce our first um, speaker, um, Tamara Turner, an interdisciplinary anthropologist and ethnomusicologist working at the intersection of psychological and medical anthropology, sound music studies, affect emotion, and expressive arts. Um, she is particularly engaged with the relationships between the arts and mental emotional health, race, religion, and post-colonialism post in North Africa and its diasporas. Her award-winning doctoral thesis was the first ethnomusicological research to thoroughly document the musical repertoire, practice, and history of Algerian Duan, a nocturnal trance ritual of the Bilalia Sufi order that emerged out of the trans-Saharan slave trade. So I think we're going to hear a bit more about this today. So please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Is this working? OK. Thanks so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. And um, it was such a great day yesterday um, with the beginning of the paper. So I hope there'll be a lot here of, of resonance. So I want to just begin with some, um, some fundamentals to kind of walk you through what, what I'm going to cover in the paper. And first is this quote I love by Vincent Crapanzano, that much of what we call, in the, call psychological in the West and locate in some sort of internal space in the head, in the mind, and brain, and consciousness, in the psyche, is understood in many cultures and manifestly non-psychological terms and located in other spaces. And this will become important because in Algerian Diwan, the ritual practice I've been studying for the last 10 years, um, the psychological is very much embedded in space as a spatio-temporal phenomenon related to ancestors and relationships that Avon was speaking about earlier. So let's start with first, what are some basic notions of suffering and healing in this context? So I use the term mental emotional health because we're talking about trauma. and. Um, and suffering and, and what it means to be well. So I'm using the word ihsas in Arabic to roughly speak about feelings, which can be both sensory feelings, like prickling skin, as well as emotions. And there's a really interesting concept in Algerian Diwan called hal. And this term shows up in other Sufi orders. But in Algeria, it is both an atmosphere, a personal mood, and a trance state. So this suggests that the personal psychological can be coterminous with the environment. If atmosphere that we share is also related to my state, then what does that mean about working pain and suffering in a community space? So here again, the social and environment and environmental are implicated in the personal and psychological. And this has to, has to do with affects of how they're worked in space that we'll hear more about, especially in, in terms of music. So the notions of the body become really important here. And we're not just talking about um, a physical body, but also the felt phenomenological body, so corporeality, or what it feels to be a body. Uh, this is important in trance. And so in the ritual, these feelings have to be worked through the body um, in, in, in a trance state in order to work pain and suffering out. And then lastly, music does this so well because of it, its being a spatio-temporal art, bringing us back to these notions of atmosphere and the psychological embedded in atmosphere, and because of its affective vibrational qualities, which can be physically felt. So it's not only powerful symbolically, but also physically. So I'm going to go more into this later, but just to map out a few things here with the different kinds of trance happening in the D1 ritual. So um, there's three different. Uh, categories of trance, roughly. The first, jedba, also a common term you hear in Sufi orders across North Africa, means attraction. It's, it's largely thought about as kind of a light, playful kind of trance. Hal, which is also this environment, atmosphere, but is a trance state when condensed, has a little bit more to do with losing agency. And some of my interlocutors uh, expect sort of supernatural uh, elements to come in in this, in this state of trance. And then finally, we have Buri, which comes from the House of Buri ceremony. And this is what we tend to call spirit possession in anthropology, so, or inhabitation of spirits in bodies. But more interesting to me is that there are dozens of terms to describe how trance feels. So we have all of these different ways of how we can feel sick or struck, mounted, inhabited, kidnapped, seized. So these are all affective descriptions of varieties of the way that trance can feel that may or may not map onto Jadba, Hal, and Bori. So basically the point is being it's incredibly nuanced what, what is happening in trance. And this is one thing I'm really interesting, interested in looking at in terms of how mental, emotional pain and suffering gets worked through the body. 
So then we have verbs for, for different um, trance modalities. Yejdeb, which is, comes from jedba, uh, to be drawn into something, to go absent, traveling, um, being mounted uh, again, and yrib, which is a common one we, we see across other orders as well, um, to go absent. Uh, and yet will or churning and thrashing. So again, a wide range of different kind of trance modalities, um, which we'll see a bit more of in some videos at the end. Okay, so just in terms of all of these various nuances and categories, we have a, a pretty typical formula, we could say, where at the moment of ignition, so there's a mu something musical happening that the person loses a state of agency and will have some sort of process of passing out or, or losing track of themselves, often needing help. Um, then they'll have to be caught or sometimes they'll go completely unconscious and then they regain a sense of agency and have to move towards the musicians in order to work their state. So this is kind of the general pattern of how trance arises in all of these, vari in all of these varieties. So that's kind of a, just a general mapping at the moment. So um, a, a little bit of background about me and why I was there, what I was doing. Um, these are, this is just a map of the various different families, lineages that I worked with across Algeria. So you can see it's mostly in the west. That had to do with the Trans-Saharan caravan routes. That it was, um, there were less mountains in the west to cross. Um, so that the, in the western corridor there, the D1 ceremonies are quite populous. Um, my, my research was multi-sided, but also multidisciplinary. So I spent time um, speaking with people, sitting in on rituals, discussing with both men and women practitioners and ritual leaders. And then as an ethnomusicologist, I also learned the instruments to the best of my ability in cases where it was possible, and played on stage with some um, young men in, in the festival productions of this music. So as much as possible, really embedding myself there in, in embodied ways. OK, so a bit of overview about the actual ritual D1. So as I said, it emerged out of the trans-Saharan slave trade. And these are some of the, uh, the major caravan routes that we can see going across. What's interesting about this next map, though, is it shows the interconnectivity of East and West as well. So for example, when there is um, a Hausa repertoire in D1, there's also an ex already the exchanges that had happened with other ethno-linguistic groups. So it can be quite difficult to trace origins. What that is one of the um, efforts of my researchers to try to understand where these songs came from. But in a lot of cases, um, you'll have mixed pantheons um, between groups as they arrived in North Africa and were intermingling. So it can be quite challenging to just link these south of the Sahara. So as these various, at least seven different ethno-linguistic groups arrived in Algeria through the tr slave trade, they formed communities. Um, in the west of Algeria, they called these Gurbi or Le Village Negre. Um, so this, these were usually based on uh, their own ethno-linguistic groups. So Hausa would find Hausa families to live with. Um, in Algiers, in the cities, they formed houses called Diar, plural, or Dar, singular. But since I was mostly looking at the West, this was known as a gurbi. And they were basically like a shanty town um, that gathered these ethno-linguistic groups. Over three centuries then, they also embedded with Sufi practices in the area that were already practicing various kinds of ritual trance. So these couple of slides are just showing sort of the ways that then they took on Sufi practices. So on the right-hand side, there are these flags and processions. So they, this ziyara, or a pilgrimage to a saint's tomb. This was something that these communities took on. And on the left, we have um, a friend at, the sum, at, at, at a tomb of a saint. So they then took in the Muslim saints as well in what anthropology has often called a syncretic practice, um, blending the sub-Saharan African with North African practices. Um, these, the, these slides are just showing, in Arabic, the Zawiya Sidi Bilal. That's what's, that's what's spelled across there. And Zawiya is a particularly Sufi term of a ritual lodge. So in calling themselves Zawiya Sidi Bilal, they're really emplacing themselves within a tradition of North African Sufism. Um, Bilal being the, the, the black man in Islam who was the first caller to prayer uh, bought out of slavery from the Prophet Muhammad. So they're identifying him as a kind of spiritual father. Before these rituals, then, they're also emplacing themselves within the fold of Islam by starting off with Quranic recitation before the festival. So this was a photo taken at 
one of the larger festivals where the men sit together and recite passages of the Quran before they begin this ritual. So again, um, really in placing themselves within this history. Uh, I think I'm going to skip the audio for the moment to make sure there's plenty of time to play the videos, which will be more interesting. So then lastly, as, as they're blending with these North African Sufi practices, um, Diwan becomes one of many different healing traditions in North Africa that are always grappling with this relationship between religion and therapy. And even within the local discourses, this is something that, that people will talk about is to what degree is this religion and to what degree is it therapy. So they're separating out these things, which I found quite interesting. Um, as a, racism is alive and well in Algeria, these black communities are often thought of as practicing voodoo as a derogatory term. Um, so they're always kind of self-consciously trying to situate themselves within Islam, but then also claiming their African history because there's, at the same time, this movement now of Mama Africa and everything African and black is becoming more and more trendy and cool. So they're at this very awkward juncture of trying to both claim their sub-Saharan African ancestry, but also being legitimately Muslim. It's quite a um, yeah, difficult position to be in. So moving into the sound world, this is a photograph I took of two of, two of my dear interlocutor musician friends. So this is the, the instrument is the gimbri, this guitar-like instrument that the man on the right is playing. Um, and then on the left, uh, you can sort of see these krak, these metal castanets that are played that accompany the gimbri. The gimbri has this low bass register sound, and it comes specifically from sub-Saharan Africa. So its ancestors south of the Sahara, for example, we have the Fulani Hodu, the House of Molo, and the Bambra. Um, they have various kinds of ngonis and large ngonis. That's Basuku Kuyate in the top right, for those of you who may know him. So, so this is where the gimbri comes from, although it does not exist in sub-Saharan Africa as it exists in North Africa. And this is a fantastic map by ethnomusicologist Eric Cherry showing lutes across West and North Africa. So they're really, really prominent. Um, yeah, and some say even more than this idea of the drums in Africa. So for example, in across the Maghreb, we have on the left the various sizes and shapes of the Moroccan gimbri, or hejouj. In the middle, we have Tunisian stambeli, and on the right, Algerian um, gimbris. Oh, sorry, in, um, in, in the middle, of the, that's the gumbri in Tunisia, and then on the right, they, they call it gimbri in Algeria. So usually in Algeria, it's this really boxy, large boxy shape. Okay, so to some ritual dynamics. Uh, this photograph is critical in terms of, uh, this is on the right-hand side, the man in white is called the moqadim, which is a term from Sufism. Uh, he is the ritual leader. He's also communicating with spirits. He's the guy in charge of the atmosphere to make sure the vibe is good, um, that, that, that the healing potential is, is being realized, but, but also just really managing the feel of the ritual. So trance is not willy-nilly. It's highly organized, highly policed. So he's holding his hand out to stop this guy and to direct other trancers in the ritual space. So these are other trancers here moving back and forth between the musicians, and he's in charge, so he's quite important. In this ritual space, then, here we have the Mokadam, that ritual leader. Uh, the Mahalla, M-H, is a trunk of ritual objects. So he's using these ritual objects and putting them on trancers who are moving back and forth across the space. And this arc here are the musicians. So you have these trancers moving back and forth with the musicians, and you'll see this in the, in the videos. And then these are the publics here, just w women and men on different sides. Now, critical of how music is doing this, how the ritual is structured, is with the song order. So the entire ritual architecture is based on these groups of songs. It's not important that you can read the text in these blocks. I, I'm using them to just demonstrate this highly organized, predictable song order. So these blocks are spirit pantheons. So here we have Migzawin, which is a Hausa group, which comes at the end, and also Hausaween. They separate them in D1. But then we have also saints, water spirits, air spirits, earth spirits. So these are separated into families. So people know when their song is coming, for example, and are anticipating that. Each one of these songs has aesthetics, colors, tastes, smells that are, that are performed during ritual. This is a song for the Prophet Muhammad. This is a song for the Saint Abdul Qadir Jilani, who has to depict an old man with a candle, sometimes a staff, who trances very gently. 
Uh, so, the, so the trance states vary on what kind of spirit it is or saint. Um, and this will be policed by the muqaddam as well if somebody starts trancing in a way that doesn't fit. Uh, this is a, a saint uh, coming forth during a ritual who will wear a white cloak. But like so, some of the um, previous papers we heard, especially on the Garifuna, for example, there are different colors that, that, separ that identify certain spirits, um, smells, tastes, all the, the sensory qualities that are supposed to identify that person in that kind of trance. Now, music, of course, is shaping these trance experiences, and one of the most important things about it is its cyclicity. So it's a circular, cyclical process where music is layering in, instruments are laying in, vocals are layering in, and then there's an intensification process happening here. So this is all as a kind of buildup. What I'm identifying as an like, ignition process of really warming the space. And uh, ritual practitioners will talk about warmth as a D1 hammy, a warm D1. So metaphors of heat are really, really critical here. And they'll talk about um, launching or setting on fire the atmosphere. Yitla is the word they use. Um, so there's this, with healing, there, it, there are these metaphors of warmth, of intensification, and this connection to fire that was brought up earlier. I just want to see where I'm at with time. Okay, we have 15 minutes. So um, this is, uh, I'll look quickly over this, but for, for musical nerds in the room, there's also musical techniques of ambiguity, of playing with feel that can, that can move between beats. And had Stephen Friedson been able to make it, I would have loved to speak, spoke, to speak with him about this because there's this idea of the musical gestalt and how this might also be feeding into trance states. Um, but in the essence of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass over l listening to this, and m more critically here, this is a, a slide from Rich Jankowski's book on this intensification in, of of musical material, and so not only speeding up, but also this density, this densification, and temporal compression that is that is very much a part of music structuring these trance experiences. So as I was showing with that photo series. Um, when somebody's sort of passing out and then is brought in front of the musicians to work their state, there's a, every single song in this repertoire has a section at the end called the sug, which means to drive. So they're literally driving them to the point where they collapse. So this intensification is all part of this buildup of transformation and release. So this is back to this slide about ways that trans can feel. Just to remind us, I'm going to be showing some videos of these different states. So. Again, um, there are also modalities um, that fluctuate on a spectrum. So somebody can start off in jedba, for example, this lighter uh, modality of trance, and then move into inhabit inhabiting a spirit. One of the most interesting things I found, too, in my field work, especially in terms of the way spirit possession is often written about in anthropology, is that when I watched people inhabited by a spirit, you could see them wrestling with the spirit at times. So it wasn't this complete embodiment and they were gone, sometimes. But a lot of the time, you really could feel that it was this relationship, this play where the spirit and the person are struggling for agency. I talked about the body earlier, and I just want to make a couple comments about this here. In different, I think the body is so important to talk about in trance because, particularly in states of disassociation, for example, um, where we separate from the body, where the mind or the self is separating from the body, it's important to think about the relationship to the physical body, to the felt body. So, this is a chart by Scott Kugel interpreting the work of Moroccan scholar Farid al Zahi who uses the Arabic system to talk about ways of being a body. So, um, so he's, he's, he's thinking about what does it mean to have a physical body, but then relationships to that. So this becomes critical, once again, in terms of when we're talking about mental emotional suffering and how, how do we relate to ourselves in a suffering state. So the ways that people are talking about this, for example, um, I don't feel well. So, this is not ecstasy. This is not some kind of like um, reaching heightened states of joy and happiness. It really is about working pain through the body. Um, one of the key phrases is about control. I can't control myself. Um, and, and, I, and I must go absent in order to work these things. So there's an idea about letting other things take over in trance. And finally, um, that one has to go with the music. They, they have to go with the melody. Um, and travel with it. This is part of like giving over agency to be, uh, in order to be healed. So, 
So these are, these are common things across all these varieties of trance. So I want to show you first a video of Jedba trance. And if you watch carefully, there's a moment where incense or bachor is brought to this man. He's 80. He's trancing. And this is where, if you watch carefully, there's a bit of a shift in his affective state. <laughs> So in this case, he's able to stop the musicians um, and 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 change at least arise enough to to change the um, to stop the music. Um, so can I play a couple of more? Okay. Um, let me start with the next uh, one, which is how, which is a, which is quite beautiful. <laughs> being caught and, and physically needing to be helped through by other people standing by. So he's trying to work his own state and reaches a certain point where he's not able to, to do this enough and is helped and makes this sign, which is a sign of submission to the spirits. And very lastly, this just sums up my point about this intensification. This is the very, very end of a song um, at, the, at the moment called the soup, where they're driving somebody till they collapse. And I'll finish with this. <laughs> at the end is, is placing it again within the fold of Islam by, by prayers to the Prophet. So, so I'm sorry I had to rush through those at the end, um, but we can talk more about that later if there's time at the end. So thank you very much for your attention. So next I'd like to introduce um, Samuel Yano. Um, Samuel is a cultural historian of music and a senior lecturer in Spanish cultural studies at the University of Manchester. Specialized in the study of music and sound in Spain and the Western Mediterranean. Um, following his first two books, which applied key theory on transnationalism and urban studies to the study of music in Spain and France, his current research studies the racialization of music and sound in colonial Morocco. He's writing a book titled The Empire of the Ear, Music, Race, and the Sonic Architecture of Colonial Morocco that studies the ways in which musical practice, sound, and musicological discourse created complex and ambiguous spaces uh, in which colonial power was consolidated, contested, and negotiated 
Um, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. So uh, what I'm presenting today is part of, um, of the book that Ellen just referred to, um, in which I look not only at, uh, at Sufi trance dancing, but uh, look at it within a broader context of different musical practices that include as well uh, Andalusian music, and uh, try to find, um, uh, trying to strike a balance between the production of these scores through musicology and scholarship and uh, the practice itself. Um, but then again, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. An, uh, I, I'm doing historical work in the colonial context. I'm not based on ethnography. Okay. So recent years have seen a rise of interest in the study of trans dancing in the Maghreb. Um, a spate of new studies have shed light on the role of trans dancing in shaping identity-making processes among the Maghreb's Imasigan, Ganawa, and Stambeli minorities, following the independence of North African states. Uh, these studies have raised important questions about the form and structure of the dances and have made significant contributions to understanding the process through which Sufi trance dancing has transitioned from local scenes to the world stages while constructing and negotiating ethnicities in increasingly globalized spaces. Further, they have explored the ways in which the memory of trauma and slavery is enacted through dance, particularly in the case of the Ganawa and the Stambeli. I believe, however, that there are still important questions to be asked regarding the more recent traumatic experience of colonialism in the Maghreb from the 1830s to 1950s and 60s, approximately, depending on which country we're talking about. So in this context, Sufi dance is developed under the close scrutiny of the colonial authorities and military personnel, and were treated as objects of control and subjects of study within a highly racialized system of knowledge. This period features in current scholarship on trans dancing as a decisive moment in which persecution and control led to the reinforcement of ethnic bonds among the Turuk, that is the Sufi brotherhoods, and to the grouping of previously unrelated ethnicities under increasingly comprehensive ethnic categories. So this paper argues that the Turuk, the Sufi brotherhoods, challenged this control in several ways. On one hand, they organized semi-clandestine mass festivals, the Amarat, in which dance was used to reinstate and reenact the ancestral lineages from which the Turuk gathered le legitimacy and political power. On the other hand, they sanctioned and spread curative remedies and traditions that challenged the foundations of Western medicine. In so doing, they drove the Maghrebi populations away from the biopolitical control exercised through the spread of biomedical disciplines and methods such as pasteurism. Although in my work I focus on both the political activity at the Amarat and the use of methods that challenge Western medicine, this paper focuses mainly on this second aspect, which is more closely aligned with the goals of this conference. My analysis is based mainly on archival records and scholarship produced by the Spanish colonial administration in Morocco, although in my work I also consider the records and scholarship produced by the French too. In studying Spain, or Spanish discourse rather, I give visibility to a body of knowledge that tends to be overlooked by a dominant tendency to study European colonialism in the Maghreb from the perspective of France. In today's paper, I begin by outlining the origins of fear that led to trans dancing being regarded as a subject of study and an object of scrutiny in Morocco. Then I studied the forms of control that were developed by the Spanish authorities to curtail the political activity taking place in the context of man's mass dancing congregations. Last, I explore the discursive strategies used by protectorate scholars and military personnel to empty trans dancing of any religious and political meaning and represent it as a riotous act devoid of any political legitimacy. These strategies consisted mainly in creating a spurious distinction between magic and religion in order to portray curative trance as a superstition and in representing the music played at the Leilat as noise, whose effect was to reduce trans, sorry, dancers to a state of intellectual impairment and cognitive disorientation in which they could not communicate with the deity. So in his book, Temas de Protectorado, and I don't have a cover for that book, but I have another, a cover for another book by the same author, um, 
the controller and future High Commissioner Tomás García Figueras. In this book, In Temas de Protectorado, Protectorate Topics, he defended the fundamental importance of studying religion for anyone trying to colonize the Islamic peoples. I think that religion is the motif that prompts them to carry out their most decisive actions, and it's behind the convulsions that have shaken them so frequently. And I want to put the stress on the word convulsions there. So a few pages after saying this, García Figueras referred to trans-inducing dancing as a convulse agitation. So again, convulsion. So in describing both trans-dancing and military insurrection as convulsions, García Figueras did not merely establish a rhetorical analogy between them, but rather acknowledged the power of the dancing body to convey political messages and shape resistance. He regarded the Turuk as a source of insurrection, claiming that, quote, they launched their tentacles from the most remote corners of Morocco, end of quote, and accusing them of waging the jihad and fanning the flames of anti-Christian hatred. That is a quotation as well. The serialized study of the dances of the Alawite Tarika, published by the daily, Mel daily Melilla-based El Telegrama del Rif, claimed even more explicitly that these agitated dances were used to incite rebellion against Spain. The study's author, Francisco Carcaño, recounted, recounted the way in which the dancers, quote, jumped in an unharmonious way and shook their heads as if putting them out of joint, at the same time that, that they uttered curses against Spain, letting explode the hatred that was growing inside them. End of quote. Meanwhile, the Mukaddim took advantage of their hallucinatory state, making them see in a bowl of water, quote, the image of Spain being thrown out of Africa by the Moors, Morisma he used as a word. Fernando Frade Merino's Mysticismo Islamico, again, I have a cover for another book by Fernando Frade, not by the one I'm, 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 I'm quoting, I'm, I'm using. So Fernando Frade Merino's Mysticismo Islamico, a lecture from the courses given to the controllers during the season 1949 to 1950, described trance as a state in which dancers are, quote, extremely amenable to the suggestions of the Sheikh of, or Mukaddam, whose power has had a decisive influence on the achievement of many war victories, end of quote. So these testimonies show that the Spanish authorities feared trans dancing and regarded it as a medium for the shaping of anti-colonial resistance and the expression of insurrectionist ideas. Further, they regarded the Mukaddim as a political figure, capable of controlling and altering the mental and emotional states of participants in ways that could challenge the colonial rule. Above all, the authorities feared that trans dancing could contribute to destabilizing the colonial order and the class structure in Morocco. They regarded the use of physical violence by some of the most popular Turuk, such as the Aisawa and Hamacha, as a corruption of true Islam, a show of bad taste that pandered to the instincts of the lower classes, and, and, and as a manifestation of the potential threat of Morocco's lower classes to the Spanish rule in Morocco. The Spanish feared that what they thought was the corruption of true Islam by the common people could lead to the demise of class hierarchies creating a cultural continuum in which it was no longer possible to distinguish between original and copy, authentic and fake, high and low. Control of the dances involved the policing of the muasim, the plural for mausim, the seasonal pilgrimages to the shrine of each tarika, and required the imposition of restrictions on the movements of participants as they made their way towards joining the procession. Many letters held at the archives of the Spanish Protectorate in Morocco show that Spanish officials exchanged information on the Muasim, such as their itinerary and perceived degree of extremism, and used that information to closely survey them and even to ban some of them. The Spanish authorities were particularly concerned about the pilgrimages that crossed the border between French, the French and the Spanish zones of the Moroccan Protectorate, as it was believed that some of the pilgrims were spying for France. In response to this concern, the Spanish authorities paid a few Moroccan shepherds to survey and report on these movements. Alternatively, a few Moasim were organized in the Spanish zone to prevent the further crossing of frontiers. 
Surveillance was sometimes carried out directly by the controllers and the military who attended in person the Amarat, the festivals that took place after several weeks of pilgrimage. Access to these festivals, which often included trance dancing, was rarely gained by force, but rather by earning the respect and confidence of Turuk members through strategies such as funding the restoration of sanctuaries and shrines. In addition to the use of direct surveillance, the collection of data, the interpretation of statistics, and the production of knowledge were an effective means of control, aimed at orienting the work of controllers and the military on the ground. The scholarship sponsored by the Spanish Protectorate was rarely produced by properly trained specialists, but rather mostly by military and administrative personnel, some of whom had read extensively and amassed an impressive amount of knowledge, as was the case of García Figueras and Maldonado, the two figures I've already referred to. The scholarship and reports produced by the Spanish administration blurred the limit between the real and the imaginary, while at the same time maintaining a clear dichotomy between religion and magic, the body and the mind, the physical and the spiritual. The simultaneous affirmation and blurring of these different binary oppositions, although contradictory in appearance, arose from the view that curative trance was no more than a superstition that defiled sacred, sacred religious beliefs. This view was often expressed in language that represented trans dancing as a senseless act, disruptive of the social and colonial order and devoid of any genuine meaning. This interpretation of trans is problematic on several counts. First, the Turuk do not inhabit a religious realm separate from the secular, but are in fact embedded in a secular system of beliefs and practices. This peculiarity explains why critics of trans dancing lump this practice together with curative remedies that were not necessarily linked to Sufism, such as the use of amulets, aromatic plants, perfumes, the kitaba or magic power of writing, and the much widespread bloodletting. Second, in Morocco, there is no sharp line dividing the domains of religion and magic, as argued by David Hart. In contrast to Durkheim, who separated between the two concepts and placed the genun within the realm of magic, Hart argues that the baraka is a miraculous, a wonder-working power, operating on the opposite end of the antisocial, which is often associated with magic. So underlying the views of the Spanish was their inability to understand this incredible nature of Moroccan medicine. As argued by Joseph Luis Mateo Dieste, Moroccan medicine draws from a range of traditions, including prophetic medicine, which searches for answers in the Quran, humoral medicine, which is inspired in classic Arab medicine, the knowledge of seers who use magic, the management of sanctuaries, which um, administers the baraka, and biomedicine, which rests upon scientific findings and was introduced by Europeans in Morocco. These different traditions do not exclude each other, but in fact coexist within the same treatments. European scholars tended to deny the multiplicity of and, co and coexistence of these traditions and lump them all together, tagging all curative practices current in Morocco as superstitions. In contrast to scholarship, a few reports by Spanish doctors and controllers boasted about the extent to which the rural populations were gradually adopting biomedicine and yielding to the supposed superiority of Western science. Nido, for instance, claimed that a growing number of Moroccans attended the dispensaries daily, and that this increase was proof of the huge transcendence, this is a quote, of the disinterested contribution made by Spanish doctors in Morocco. A Kabil report claimed that Moroccans no longer attended the medical practices only as a last resort after exhausting all other options, but that a growing number, number sorry, did so willingly as their first option. Okay. Descriptions of Sufi trance dancing as a stunning activity that numbed the senses of the dancers and confused their mind were another or was another discursive strategy through which the Spanish emptied this practice of meaning. Spanish scholarship represented Sufi trance as a state in which the sensorium was saturated by overwhelming stimuli, and the dancers' cognitive capacities were impaired, reducing them to a half-conscious, unresponsive state 
that the Spanish dismissed as a manifestation of stupidity. And, and this is a quote, uh, this is a word they use. Descriptions of the music often use vocabulary drawn from the semantic field of noise, moving trance dancing away from music and towards notions of chaos and disruption. This technique relied in part on a tradition of rhetoric that dismissed the lowly classes and their discursive equivalents, such as the Aizawa and Hamacha in this paper, as noisy and unrefined people. And here I'm using the work of Karim Lichterveld. The aesthetic moralism that orients this rhetoric relies on and in turn nourishes views that noise is sound that is out of place, as argued by Bailey. According to Douglas Kahn, it is only because certain types of people are outside of any representation of social harmony that their speech and other sounds associated with them are considered to be noise. The following examples show that the Spanish authorities and scholars understood sonic harmony or oral hygiene as an, in, as an index of modernity and civilization and an expression of the colonial order that the noisy dances, noisy here, I'm using their um, rhetoric, uh, threatened to destabilize. Maldonado Vázquez described a hadra as a chaotic mix of competing noises, a true cacophony. The noise of cymbals, drums, tabors, and flutes mixes with that of singing and dancing as they follow the stomping of the feet on the floor and the shrieks. The saturation of the ear reduces dances to a state of torpor in which they remain indifferent to the calls addressed to them and do not even raise their head. They are wrong to believe that they get closer to the deity in this way. Damn ignorance. Maldonado considers that the impact of noise forms part of a broader saturation of the full sensorium, which reduces dancers to a state of stupidity. Exhausted by the dance and the smell of incense and sweat, they fall into a half-conscious ecstasy that prompts them to say all sorts of stupid things. This description denies that the dancers establish any form of communication with the deity. Maldonado Vázquez represents trance as a state in which all intellectual faculties are suspended or impaired, and that is devoid of any mystic or spiritual death. García Figueras pursued a similar strategy by representing trance as a shallow fit of epilepsy, devoid of any religious dimension. Their faces were livid and convulsed, their eyes were out of orbit, and their mouth was covered in foam. Their faces were febrile and epileptic, and some were lit up by indescribable smiles, while others let only the white in their eyes to be seen. Meanwhile, others suffered contractions as if gripped by an atrocious spasm, or were as pale and motionless as a corpse. García Figueras focuses only on the external features of trance, merely describing its physical manifestations. In this way, he contributes to dehumanizing trance and emptying it of any religious meaning. With the same intention, he compared the state of trance attained by the Aizawa with the effect produced by the smoking of opium. These testimonies use rhetorical images of noise to undermine the religious foundations of trance. Enrique Arquez drew on a similar semantic repository to represent trance dancing as a social disorder and an illegitimate form of anti-colonial struggle. The barbaric music is louder than the singer's sad psalmody women's cellulation, and people's noisy racket. Music shrouds everything, fills everything, and overwhelms. It is scary, like the roaring of a tempest falling upon us, because the demons are hidden behind its din. Arquez's testimony adds substance to Jack Attali's contention that every noise evokes an image of subversion. It is repressed, monitored. The testimonies above consider loudness and timbre to be the main factors contributing to the production of sonic disruption and cognitive disorientation. A number of scholars were also struck by the use of repetition, but I do not have time to explore these in some detail, unfortunately. So to conclude, the colonial history of Sufi trance dancing in Morocco reveals important details about the ways in which the Turuk used dance to negotiate their identity at a critical moment of their history. The discussion above shows that dance was a site of struggle and a tool of identity construction, and confirms that the strengthening of ethnic bonds within the different Turuk developed greatly during colonialism in response to external threat and persecution. 
It is interesting to observe that no traces of this memory are apparent in today's practice, which rather evokes and invokes a more distant past. The Turuk keep reenacting the memory of their founders, or in the case of the Genawa and Stambeli, a past of slavery and trans-Saharan migration. The reasons for this erasure of memory may be multiple and are hard to fathom. They are partly to do with the process of depoliticization undergone by the Turuk following the independence of Maghreb states in the 1950s and 60s. This last stage of persecution has led the Turuk to seek refuge on the stages of music festivals, where they have enjoyed greater attention and a more lucrative or at least stable future. At the same time, they have been gradually pushed towards a space that is removed from politics and in which they tend to be regarded as folklore. In revisiting the colonial history of these dances, I do not intend to drag them away from the stages of world music festivals, but rather to raise the question, why does the scholarship tend to echo the Turuk's bypassing of colonial history? Why is the colonial past not a matter of critical inquiry and scholarly interest in the study of these dances? I believe that part of the reasons may have to do with the dynamics developed through fieldwork in which the scholar's attention may be drawn towards interrogating those aspects of Sufi trance dancing that the Turuk make visible through performance. Uh, further, the question I have raised requires that one prioritizes the use of archival materials and questions the evidence provided through fieldwork. On the other hand, archival resources are the product of literacy and in this context of study are testimony to the thinking of European scholars and colonial administrators only. To conclude, I believe that we need to work towards finding ways in which archival research and ethnography could be reconciled and in which the relative advantages of either method may be both questioned and exploited and the insights that each of them yields are mutually enriched. Thank you very much for your attention. And our third speaker today is a discussant, um, Richard Janskowski. Uh, who um, is on the faculty at Tufts University um, and was previously on the faculty of the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, England. Um, a bit about his work, through fieldwork-based methods, Professor Jankowski's primary area of research revolves around the intersection of music, ritual, and power in North Africa, particularly music's capacity to heal, to maintain, and narrate histories of underrepresented populations. Um, his most recent book, Ambient Sufism, Ritual, Niches, and the Social Work of Musical Form, um, and his previous book, Stambelli, Music, Trance, and Alterity in Tunisia, have been cited several times in the previous work, thus you can see why we invited him to be our discussant today uh, for this talk. He's a two-time National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow and has also received grants from the American Institute of, for Maghreb Studies, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and Fulbright. Um, he's got a very long bio. I could go on reading because I think they're still working on technology, but we'll see maybe if they're ready yet. <laughs> okay, some more time. Um, born at a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he also received his BA in anthropology and music from Tufts University, where he teaches now, and his PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Chicago um, as well. So with that, it looks like we're up and running. So please, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Evan, uh, for the, the generous introduction and the invitation to, to come here. And thanks to everyone who's been putting on this remarkable conference. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging my gratitude for uh, my teachers, my mentors, uh, and particularly in the case of, uh, of, of this presentation, um, the Sufi sheikhs and, and musical masters uh, living and past, who shared their knowledge um, so generously with me and who encouraged me to share that knowledge with you. Um, one other point is that this is the first presentation I've ever made with my new glasses, and it's a little disorienting, and so please spare, uh, give me a, a little bit of um, understanding here as I get used to those. So because the papers, um, so I'm here on the, on the panel as a, as a discussant. 
Um, and Tamara and Samuel were so kind to share their papers with me well in advance, like two weeks, which is like an eternity in academic time, right? Um, uh, they really, those papers really inspired me to, to create my own slides and, you know, um, sort of weave my own work into uh, my response, which is something that uh, Evan also encouraged me to do. So um, I think I'm more of a respondent than a discussant today. So thank you for, for indulging me. So Samuel provides an account of colonial reports of trance dancing that is really important for us, for our understanding um, of the European incomprehension and distaste for such physical states. These are attitudes that continued among post-colonial elites and helped push these practices further to the margins of what the post-colonial state envisioned itself uh, becoming. And Tamara approaches this space of incomprehension with an important study of different styles and states of trance. Far from being chaotic, these trance states are understood in a complex system of linguistic designations, all of which strive to get at something that is beyond language. And that's one of the big challenges we all have who work in music and trance and uh, the spiritual world, right? So trance movements in the different types of trance movements index different types and degrees of suffering, as Tamara has shown, and also that incomprehensible otherness to colonial observers, as Samuel demonstrated. Those physical movements are part of individual and collective ritual journeys that are unavailable without music, as both of our presenters have suggested. Music shapes these ritual journeys. And I use the term journey very, very deliberately, as both uh, the, the musicians and the trancers and other ritualists with whom uh, I, I worked refer to that experience of participating in a ritual as a journey. They use the Arabic term rihla. And rihla uh, actually isn't just any kind of journey. It's in the, the history of Islam, uh, a journey uh, for the purpose of acquiring knowledge and gaining experience. Um, so, you know, it's certainly not devoid of meaning, as the um, colonial observers might, might have. Um, and these are not just physical journeys. They are sonic journeys, metaphysical journeys that conjure the ancestors. So in, in North African Sufism, each Sufi order is named after a founding saint, and there's a lineage, a, a silsila, a chain of, um, of sheikhs throughout history, and all of those are conjured from the past to give meaning and bear upon the present. Um, so the question I would like to get at in my time here uh, today has to do with the musical conditions for this trance uh, or these trances that do so much. Uh, Tamara mentioned her intensification. Every borge, that is every song for a saint or a spirit, uh, undergoes acceleration. Um, and that's more than a picking up of speed. It also increases sonic density. So that means more stuff is happening in, in any given unit of, of time. Um, and that density is important, and that, you know, often described as, as noise by um, observers who don't, don't know uh, what's going on. So that kind of increase in sonic density is central to what I will refer to today as the process of sonic intensification. Um, and on a related note, uh, Samuel's paper reveals that colonial observers categorize Sufi music as noise. So the question that emerges from the papers today for me is, what is the nature of this so-called noise? Why is it so appropriate for individuals who are grappling with certain forms of suffering, yet is so ungraspable to colonial ears? And what are its internal logics? So I'd like to offer just some quick examples from my work with the Isawiya Sufi order of Tunis. Uh, that suggest a focus on sonic intensification can help shed some light on this. So 
The first audio example I have is uh, of what I call discrete intensification, um, which is when you have one phrase, one uh, short phrase that is repeated in a cyclic uh, form in, or manner and which transforms over time. As it gets faster and faster, it gets shorter and shorter. And in this case, the pitch also rises. So it starts low and slow and carries the participants along this journey to something faster and faster and higher and higher. So um, I'm just going to play uh, a couple of different points of this recording to demonstrate. <laughs> emphasize is that each repetition brings the reciters somewhere to a faster tempo to a higher tonal center. Colonial observers tended to consider this sense of repetition as meaningless, as a lack of development. Quite the contrary. Repetition and thus cyclicity creates the conditions for change. It's not merely a succession of sames over and over, because each repeat is experienced in relation to what came before it and what listeners expect and practitioners expect to have come after it. Um, and uh, these sonic transformations are inseparable from spiritual transformations. I mean, this is, this is what is happening in uh, in the ritual for people to experience in uh, a heightened state of consciousness and transcendence. So while repetition creates a kind of sense of flow, it also keeps the reciters in place focused on a single textual passage, here the name of God. So repetition from this perspective has the dual capacity to provide stability and the comfort of constancy um, on the one hand, while also creating a sense of movement and forward direction on the other. And this is just one of the uh, beautiful ambiguities of music and sound in, in ritual. So as the ceremony proceeds, the group turns to uh, a second part of the, uh, of the ritual, um, which is called Shistri. It's uh, Andalusi song. So it's actually secular song, although secular in quotes because um, it's uh, poetry about wine and love that is read in a, in a religious um, way. But these are songs that are played in you know, concert music, uh, art music um, uh, context. Uh, it's music associated with the Islamic empire when uh, it ruled part of present-day um, Spain and, and Portugal. So while you also have discrete intensification because each piece increases in, in tempo, gets faster through acceleration, um, there's another form of intensification introduced in this section, which I call sequential intensification. And that involves the modulation from one rhythm uh, that is long to uh, another rhythm that is, that is shorter, and this happens in a prescribed sequence. Um, so you don't need to read music for this. Just see how the numbers decrease and the number of strikes 
um, decreases as well. So you have, you know, you're starting with eight beats, moving to four, moving to two, and you're still getting faster and faster. And even though the last one is three beats, it's actually faster than the one with two because you only have two notes. Um, and just like what we heard before, Allah, 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 you have it ending with a one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So there's this shared logic between the so-called secular music that you hear now or will hear and um, the religious recitation. So let's just take a quick listen to that. Here's the beginning. <laughs> slowly to the end. There we go. Okay, well, you get the... <laughs> So there's a logic to this, a very clear musical sonic uh, logic to intensification that is structural there. You modulate in a prescribed sequence to another, um, uh, another rhythm. And this happens throughout. Um, it's, it's a very standard logic. So now, in the final section of the ceremony, we see another form of intensification um, which only arrives in kind of retrospect because uh, it's what I call global intensification. You remember we began with just vocals, right? You just heard vocals. Then another layer was added. That was the tambourine and the two small kettle drums. Um, so in the third part, a whole drum ensemble is added. So you have added layers over time that increase, again, the texture of of sound, so you're increasing the sonic density there. And then when you're in this uh, section, you also go through another sequential um, intensification. So all the different intensifications sort of come together at this um, culminating moment, and very tellingly, this is when individualized trance happens. It's not until uh, you get into the uh, all three of these forms of intensification coming together. Um, so I will play some of this. <laughs>
each of those dancers has is is engaged in their own form of trance that is um, that comes from the trance repertoire of of this group. Some dance with fire. Some roll on cactus. Um, what do you call it? Leaves or or stalks. Um, uh, some chew on glass and uh, eat nails. And in the southern part of the country, um, live scorpions. Um, so this is related to, you know, issues of um, of suffering and the and self harm that Tamara was was talking about. Um, uh, just early, in the earlier panel, in her her question, how you know inflicting harm on oneself can be a way of getting at the suffering uh, head on. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just skip forward and read a quote by Shahab Ahmed, um, which reads: "The historical." bulk of the normative discursive tradition of Muslims is non-prescriptive and non-orthodoxizing. Instead, it is explorative of a multiplicity of truths and values. This discourse is not governed by an authoritative urge to fix the limitations of the correct. Rather, it is informed by the urge to explore and expand the dimensions of the meaningful. And so any of us who deal with trance um, and and wine drinking and erotic poetry, you know, in the Islamic world are always asked, well, isn't that forbidden? And Shahab Ahmed in his brilliant book um, called What is Islam shows that throughout the historical um, span of the, you know, the Islamic religion, the actual norm was for people to push those limits. It's not about people, you know, uh, putting... um, Actions into categories and, and boxes. So I, I like to um, to include this particularly when I speak about uh, music and trance. But for the purposes of this panel, I'll just sum up and say why this focus on intensification. Um, for me, a model that gets at intensification is a way to locate, to give name to, and encourage analytical attention to processes of transformation that carry participants on their ritual journey. Uh, It's also important to recognize that, you know, the transformations that uh, intensification rely on um, and that larger sense of journey, they all rely on the virtues of continuity of sound um, through cyclicity, which creates the conditions for gradual transformation. And transformation is thoroughly contingent upon the, that comfort of constancy, which is crucial to trance states yet impenetrable to colonial observers. So here we're talking about ritual. Um, and ritual musical forms are special. They require their own vocabulary. Um, the power of ritual for anthropologist Bruce Kapferer lies in its capacity to generate focus by slowing down the tempo of everyday life and keeping at bay the fractured and chaotic nature of everyday experience. And in doing so, it highlights and magnifies certain aesthetic processes. He calls these ritual dynamics. Certain aesthetic processes that shape perception and transform experience. So rather than interpret sound and music as merely accompanying ritual, we see how ritual can showcase the power of sound and music to act on people. So by beginning with the local understanding of ritual as a journey, uh, this analysis highlights the cultivation of intensificatory aesthetic processes that illustrate what Shahab Ahmed calls that explorative dimension of Islamic ritual practice, something that was incomprehensible to the colonial observers analyzed by Samuel, yet absolutely central to the trancing subjects discussed by Tamara. Thank you. Um, Thanks to all the speakers, if you want to. I think we're going to invite all the speakers to come sit up front. We have about... uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. So with that, I'll open it up. 
would like to get us start. Uh, maybe just mention your name as we're all getting to know each other. Hi, everyone. Morning or afternoon. My name is Jenny Kuhn. Thank you so much for this um, really delightful and, and exciting panel. Um, there's so much resonance um, as a dancer, spirit medium, and one that journeys in the spirit. There was a lot that resonated for me in what you shared in terms of the constancy, in terms of intensification. What I was intrigued about, though, is um, I was curious about the role of the collective in terms of the individual trancer's journey. What seemed interesting for me is that it seemed, while there was a communal, uh, a, a collective action, that collective action seemed to be stirring the transfer to higher heights for his or her individual healing or his or her individual journey, as it were. And when I look comparatively to other Africana systems of which trans functions significantly in, in the ways in which we commune with the divine, the role tends to be that the, the trans, the medium, is the conduit, the portal through which the invisible communicates through them, but th for the purpose of communicating to the collective. So while an individual may be going through his or her own journey, the ultimate goal isn't so much about the individual as medium, but what that person does as a portal, as a conduit, as a channel for communication. And I was just curious in terms of that, how within the Sufi orders, the individual relates to that collective and whether it is principally an individual journey and where does the collective factor into the journey of which the medium takes. If the, I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Is it a question for all of us? Because yeah. I think there's resonance across your, your especially uh, the, um, the two of you. But whoever wants to answer. Yeah, um, yeah th thanks for the question. Um, in Algerian D1, it's um, it's a both and. Uh, while trans processes are usually worked between one person and the musicians, um, there's always the whole, there's always several people in that ritual space that are being managed by the musicians. So sometimes they'll call up a person and then they'll actually tell them, okay, your turn's over. Now I'm bringing up the next person. So, so they're managing that. But because of this notion of how this atmosphere I spoke about, that's always this what is the feeling in the room and, and it affects everybody so the kinds of care that are going on um, if there happened to be somebody wandering by who's disrupting the ritual an outsider for example they might even stop the ritual altogether because the energy is not quite right so everybody's well-being is always taken into consideration in that regard and there are a few songs in which several people dance together but for the most part these these trance dates are, are individuals so so it, it, it's all happening, um, but yeah, this might be something where it differs. There's not really a medium um, in, this, in the context that I'm, that I'm working in yet. Yeah, thank you so much. This is, uh, there's so much to say. I mean, look, so the question is um, about the collective can spread even uh, further because these are very public uh, events and so, what is the collective? Is there an audience? If you know, uh, if so, is the is the term audience uh, appropriate? Because actually, anyone who's there, even if an individual is being healed, everyone in the gathering, let's say, is witnessing not only that individual's transformation and that individual's hearing, uh, healing, but they're also witnessing the conditions and experiencing those same conditions for healing because they're internalizing, they're absorbing those, those sounds and scents and, and everything. So um, the collective versus the individual, you know, the, the lines start to, to blur. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, but structurally, in the example I just gave, um, but there are, there are Sufi orders in, uh, in Tunisia I work with that are closer to what you know, Tamara um, 
uh, presented on, where there is someone called an arifa, which in Arabic means she who knows. So the closest that we get to kind of a, a medium, um, and who leads the trancer through trance. But in the uh, in the example I gave, what's really interesting is that when everything is a cappella, it's all collectively performed. When there is uh, the addition of those two drums and it's Andalusi song, the collective uh, performs and, and dances. When the drum ensemble comes in for uh, those individualized trances, so that's when individuals break from the dance line and, and fall into trance on their own and then get the attention of the sheikh, um, that is a point when all of those intensifications uh, coalesce. So it's actually, a and so there's a reason, like for instance in D1, all the intensification is kind of, you don't have this global intensification where you begin with just vocals and then you add a layer of sound and then another layer of sound. Because when it comes to trance healing, um, we kind of do away with those uh, preliminaries and jump right into the, the end part where um, you have uh, the individual healing going on. So there is um, there's a lot going on between the individual and the collective. It's, it's hard to generalize. Um, well, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. I haven't really given much thought to it until um, you asked. I'm not sure what I can add, but when... Uh, when you made your question, um, I immediately thought of Baraka, no? the the power to heal, and um, and Baraka, of course, uh, cannot be administered by anyone. Um, so part of the ritual ceremony has to do with with um, the person who possesses the the Baraka to administer it. And I'm thinking in terms of the negotiation between the collective and the individual that you, you just mentioned. Um, the ritual ceremony forms part of a larger structure, which is that of, um, sorry, let me rephrase this. I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, apart from a healing ceremony, the ceremony is one in which um, the the structure of the, within the Tarika, within the Sufi Brotherhood, gets uh, reenacted, I suppose, or re reinforced. You know? There is a connection between the, um, the well, the mukadam, the sheikh, and um, well, especially the leader of its tariqa, and and the prophet. No, there is a, a, a Muhammad. There is a, some lineage that justifies the funding, the founding, sorry, of the of the of the tariqa, uh, whenever that was in the 16th, 17th century, most of them. Um, so I don't know if this answers your question, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that the. the um, the tensions between the collective and the individual that undoubtedly exist during a ritual ceremony also um, somehow need to be understood over the background of power relationships within each of the tarikas and uh, how that past is somehow reenacted in, in the ritual. I don't know if this is the direction you wanted to take. Um. Nadelka and then Nia. Thank you. I think I want to tag in on the conversation on community. Um, and perhaps perhaps I've, I've not seen something, but I believe that Sufism is a more masculine or is it is it gender inclusive? The reason why I'm saying that is because of the images that we saw today look very male dominant. And so in terms of healing, I was also just curious about the use of the long suffering and the modes of long suffering, like the eating, eating of glass or laying on cactus um, by men for healing, uh, for the purpose of healing through long suffering. So I'm, I'm curious about, or maybe I'm misreading it, the use, uh, the uses of those forms of expression. Um, and what would the women be doing? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a fantastic question. And um, there are women's Sufi orders, uh, of, of course, and I, I write about them in, uh, in, in my latest book. But women are also involved in a very um, 
what appears to be, from the camera I view, an indirect uh, or marginalized way. They are on in another room going through their own healing process. So they are being healed. They are falling into trance in another separate room for this particular Sufi order um, to the sounds uh, produced by the men. Um, so there is definitely a, a uh, separation there. The men's acts of self-mortification are described to me as a mystery. Um, so they say, we don't know why we do this except we're following in the footsteps of our ancestors, and it is a need. We feel it. It's a physical uh, need that emerges. But another term that they use that's in, in, important is um, that it's about sabr. And in, in Arabic, sabr is, it colloquially refers to patience, but it also means endurance um, through, uh, through suffering. Um, so you can endure, through, you need uh, sabr in order to endure uh, through suffering. So there is a kind of um, machismo and uh, a sort of <coughs> performative masculinity absolutely uh, going on. And that's really interesting that um, uh, that's a point that hasn't really been studied critically. And, and I really thank you. No, women are not doing that type of activity. Yeah. Um, is this a way of getting in touch with, like, I don't want to say that men don't feel at all, but is this a way of perhaps them perceiving that they are getting in touch with their compassion and their feeling through this kind of more physical brute force? Um, um, yeah, for themselves, I guess. I'm not sure how empathetic it is because it's very self-directed. And, um, you know, the, the cloak they wear is actually referred to as beden, which is body, so their body. And when they go into individualized trance, they, they remove it. When they're together dancing in line, they, ha they still have it on. So um, there's this sense of kind of overcoming the body. Um, the limitations of the physical body. And now we get into the realm of uh, spiritual transcendence and these ideas that are embedded in the lyrics that they're uh, singing, which are very self-referential about um, overcoming or, or gaining uh, transcendence. So there's a, a real kind of syllogism, really, between the musical uh, experience, the physical experience, and the, the spiritual experience they have. But that's a really, really great point. Thank you for bringing it up. Can I just piggyback a little on the question? Because I think we have some expertise here that we can have more of a comparative mm -hmm. analysis. Because I'm curious about the self-mortification thing, the, the, the glass. And, the, and we see this, of course, in diasporic, African diasporic traditions, the, when the, with the spirit possession, when the, the spirit will do, they'll do all kinds of stuff. I, well, so I wanted to get get some comparative insights, and then when we get to the American, the North American mainland context, it drops out completely. And so I'm thinking about the gender. Um, I'm thinking about what you know, the bodies and what the meaning of self modification uh, in these spirit uh, trance uh, traditions means. Uh, and if there is some sort of comparative insight that we can bring to bear here, so so. What, what does it mean? Or, I know that's a big question. What's going on? What does it mean? And then are there any insights that we can bring to, say, black diaspora traditions? Um, and then my other question is, you know, well, what happens in the US? I, I, I have some theories about that, but we don't even have to get to that. Is that? Yeah. So, and, and if others you know, who, who work in this too, um, are, are there any insights that we can share? I'm really curious about this, the, the violence in the body um, and what, what, what we can draw from that. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, 
The question about gender, I think, is great. Um, I can't really say anything to that. I know that Cynthia Becker has done some work and, and um, shown the work of, of women participants. On the question of violence, there is also a question of class that intersects. And uh, it's Vincent Crapanzano who talks most about this. Um, I don't know if perhaps, uh, well, clearly he, he establishes a difference between uh, the Hamatsa and the Aishawa on, on one hand and the rest of the Turuk. And he considers that those two, the reason why those two Turuk are particularly prone to self-harming practices is because they tend to be formed by the, the lowest classes of um, well, societies in, in Morocco and Algeria. And he attributes this to a, a question of class purely. I don't know if it's a bit too Marxist as a reading, but I think uh, it's a starting point. <laughs> Um, I just want to jump in quickly on that, too, because in, in the D1 ceremonies, um, the historical sources from the early 1900s say that they were primarily women-run, um, and they use this term called a hunia, and she was the priestess of the ceremony, so the women were really in charge, and the men were the musicians, but it was the women in charge, and this was when they did have a medium, and and so then there's this huge gap in scholarship after after that, and then it... So it seems like it's really the influence of Islam that then women, um, then the men kind of take over and become, and it becomes really performative with this, with the slashing of the knives. However, um, there are cases in these rituals now where the more senior women are are uh, lashing themselves with ropes um, and also using knives, although less less than the men, but they are they are doing it, and they are the women who are at the higher. Uh, hierarchies of, of who's who, um, yeah. So there, there's, there is still this gender difference, but um, I think a lot of it kind of just happened over the, over centuries of Islam taking over too. Yeah. I know that we're running low on time. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get Nia, I promise. Um, does anyone want to just jump in? Go ahead. Okay, great. Do you want to go ahead first, and then I'll. Do you mind? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mambo. Do you. Okay, um, just a quick question. Um, the question I had was about the sonic transformations, um, and it was suggested that the con it was in order to conjure the ancestors and the harmonic progression that you were talking about. I, I might wonder what could happen if we decenter the human from, from this experience, because um, I'm trying to wonder if it's really the, the human that's affecting the ancestors or the other way around. I think I think it sort of suggests that we have that kind of control over them if if what you're saying is what we're doing performing somehow accesses them as if they're sleeping and then they do some sort of thing and then all of a sudden they wake. But I always wonder about decentering the human in this process because I don't think that we have that much control over them. And my second question is this, what might be the limitations of transcribing this music into Western notation? Oftentimes during the spiritual ceremonies, even the ones that you showed, the dancers are even dancing in a, in a way that doesn't suggest that, that matches the, the notation that you, that you put up there and the measures. I think if we zoom out, you'll see that. Just as you said yourself, this type of spirituality requires their own vocabulary. So if that's the case, the vocabulary that needs to be changed, I don't think it should match necessarily that. So I'm just wondering about the limitations of Western notation in the spiritual realm in this way, and do how can we decenter the human in this process? Because I don't think that we have that much power to access them the way that we think we do. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Absolutely, uh, spot on questions. Um, I, I address um, some of them in the introduction to my to my book, Ambient Sufism where I say I didn't want to use any musical notation whatsoever for this, and certainly not Western staff <coughs> notation. And then as I put together, um, actually Tamara used one of, from a, a previous book where I just had dots that got sort of closer and closer together to show this kind of um, intensification. And I struggle with visual representations all the, um, uh, all the time. I find it you know, a, a very intellectually stimulating kind of thing, but also ethically something that's uh, important. And so I use Western staff notation very advisedly and very specifically. In this case, I used it just to show that you go from more strikes per time um, unit to fewer and to fewer um, sorts of, of beats. Now, the thing is, with the, this particular Sufi order, 
they are understood as maintaining um, the Andalusi musical tradition. That's the most um, sort of culturally prestigious um, music tradition in the region. And they consider themselves, um, they're proud of their musicality and their role in preserving uh, and developing some like musical modes that have disappeared even from the notated art music repertoire. Um, however, they're very happy when they see their music in Western staff notation. So I have, um, because to them, that indexes a kind of seriousness with which I'm taking their music. And so you have these kind of colonial um, ideas about, uh, you know, what is proper uh, music and how do you study it all mixed in here. So, yeah, I, I by no means think, so that's all I do with my analysis. I do not um, analyze, I do not think, you know, writing down the, the melody and transcribing it and, um, and uh, all of that anyway gets us closer to to the music. So it's used in a very specific way with like a list of caveats. Um, and so that's the question about um, notation. Can you remind me of the earlier question? Because that one was also of me for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So uh, Baraka, as, as Samuel was saying, is something that is beyond, it's this force that is sort of channeled through um, people and the, uh, and sort of activated um, through the collective uh, ritual. So um, when I used the term conjured, I was sort of connecting to, previous, to, to this morning's panel, but really it's invoking. And to invoke is, is slightly different um, because it's the hope that the saint's presence will be will will be um, made visible and physically um, and spiritually available. It's never a done deal. That's why ritual is so exciting in in many respects. You never know how it's going to turn out. It, it, rituals can fail, right? So, um, so absolutely. I didn't mean to put all of the uh, agency on. Um, on the human, but they, in their lyrics, are invoking litanies of uh, of saints and sort of bringing that past to bear on on the present and situating themselves within the present. But that's a, an absolutely wonderful uh, point, and I, I think we all need to be thinking about that, uh, particularly in in these contexts. Um, we're over time, but I think it's productive overtime. Um, I think Kira had a quick comment, and then we just maybe have one quick question. For, yeah, and then we'll try to wrap up. I don't think we're getting hungry. That's great. Thank you so much. I want to extend my thanks to the three of you and state in particular that I'm appreciative of your demonstration of proficiency in multiple languages. I think that that's something that is really essential. And I, my comment is really more of a concern that I have with some of the language that was used without some of the colonial contextualization. So I think when we talk about, you know, categorizations of colonial records, identifying these different traditions as noise, I think it's really important for us to think about where that comes from, right? Like from a European legacy of not understanding the complexity of African polyrhythms, right? And I understand, Samuel, for instance, that you're interrogating this archive, you're not simply repeating it. But I do think that if we're going to use terms like noise, it's important for us to think about, well, who gets to define what noise is? This is something that's so essential in the United States when we think about new noise ordinances. You have cities like New Orleans that are becoming rapidly gentrified and that all of a sudden are experiencing noise complaints for bounce music. You have the same thing happening in Washington, D.C. when you have go-go music traditions from the 1970s that all of a sudden people have the cops called on them in their own neighborhoods because gentrifying community members are all of a sudden concerned about noise, right? And so I think that those types of things are really important for us. And that's why I much more appreciated all of your uses of Arabic terms, 
or of indigenous terms to talk about ritual mounting or whatever term is most appropriate in a local context, even rather than trance, which we use in the West a lot to talk about things like demonic possession, right? And so I wanted to, to encourage us to continue using these indigenous terms because I think they demonstrate a lot more specificity in our regional context and also a great deal more respect than these other terms. So thank you. Could I, could I answer to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, th I fully agree with you. It's an excellent point. Um, oof, don't know how to uh, respond to this. Um, I suppose um, I don't think I've come across the word uh, noise in Spanish. Also, I mean, also in, in, in regards to your point about using uh, Arabic terms, in this case, since I'm dealing with um, writers in Spanish, I, I would have to resort to the, to the Spanish ruido, which doesn't appear in any of the writings. Uh, I didn't in any way try to collapse current understandings of noise, whatever they may be, because I don't think that we can understand noise, that, that we have a, a that, that, that we can understand noise as a stable category, first of all, as you've suggested, but actually to historicize it, to try to reach out to understandings of noise or understandings of, you know, sound that is, you know, out of place in the very context in which I'm operating, which is the colonial context. That's what I was trying to do. But I should have added a, a caveat, and I think you're absolutely right. We have to be extremely careful with the, with the use of categories to try to avoid imposing our own understandings of what noise or any other thing might be. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe one more quick question. Yes, I know we are all probably getting very hungry, um, myself included. So I'm just going to put out there just around language. I was curious around, in the first two presentations, um, it piqued my interest of the use of the word policing movements. Um, and so I'm just curious also, because it seems to be in conversation with agency and like letting go. So I just was wondering about more about who is doing the policing, like who is who has had the authority to decide what movements are okay or not okay, and how also those things were being decided as you have to like don't do this or different things like that in the context of also trying to create a space in which you can let go and have agency. So yeah, just to chew on. <laughs> There you go, 10-second response. Um, it has to do with feel. So when I would ask these muqaddameen, these ritual leaders, how do you know what to do? And um, it was all based on the feel in the room. And, you, and if some guy's showing off, he rips his shirt off, then, okay, that guy's just showing, that, that, that guy should, should be kicked out. So but a lot of these things are nuanced. So they would, so they would just be, yes, a, a, assessing the feel in the room or that person's vibe, that person's intention. So they use the Arabic word niya, which is about your intention you're putting into the world, and that's a felt affective presence um, that these ritual leaders know how to sense. So that's how that's how they decide: should this person be kicked out? Are they are they good? Is it there? Is there turnover? It's all about feel. Thank you.